Cavalcade of America, starring Basil Rathbone and Thomas Mitchell. Tonight, the DuPont Company brings you The President and the Doctor, starring Thomas Mitchell and Basil Rathbone on The Cavalcade of America. But first, here's Bill Hamilton of The DuPont Company. Good evening. The next time you buy an article of rainwear or sportswear for yourself or for the children, look for the Zeland tag. The tag that reads, Fabric Treated with DuPont Zeland Durable Water Repellent. Gaily colored and modernly styled garments with the added protection of Zeland for rain can be worn with comfort on bright sunny days as well. The fabrics so treated stay clean longer, too, because they're resistant to non-oily spots and stains. Best of all, Zeland protection is durable. It lasts through many washings or cleanings. Zeland, spelled Z-E-L-A-N, is one of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. Now, The President and the Doctor, a little-known story about a double crisis in the life of our nation's first president. Starring Basil Rathbun as George Washington and Thomas Mitchell as Dr. Samuel Bard on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. This is New York City, capital of the United States of America. It is the year 1789. The time is 7 o'clock in the morning of Saturday, June 13th. As the city greets the day, Mr. James Madison, congressman from Virginia, is in such a hurry that he doesn't stop when he's hailed by Colonel Alexander Hamilton. Mr. Madison! Mr. Madison! Uh, oh, Colonel Hamilton, I just had an urgent message from number three, Cherry Creek. Number three? Well, that's the president's house. What's up? I don't know, Colonel, but I think there's something wrong with the president. I think there may be something gravely wrong. <laughs> I can't understand it. I don't know what's keeping Mr. Madison. He hasn't had time to get here, Martha. Oh, dear, I do wish you'd tell me what it is, General Washington. Hmm? Tell you what what is, Martha? Tell me what's wrong with you. I wish you wouldn't always shield me. You think there's something wrong with me? I know there is. And you should know by this time that you can't hide anything from your wife. I will, uh, I'm just not feeling well, Martha, that's all. I've known something was wrong ever since the inauguration six weeks ago. Now, Martha, now, Martha, I, I'm just a bit under the weather, this uh, New York climate, I guess. No, General. It's much more serious than that. Huh? Won't you let me send for a doctor and have him look you over? But we don't know any doctors in New York, Well, yes, we do. I've already inquired. There's a Dr. Samuel Bard. Dr. Samuel Bard? Never heard of him. He's probably the best surgeon in New York. Oh, please, let me send for him. Well, well let's wait and see what Madison thinks, sir. I, I'm not saying I'm ill, mind you. You won't admit it because you're afraid the people might be upset if they thought their president was a sick man. But I'm your wife and I know something's wrong. Oh, dear. I wish we'd never left Mount Vernon. Mark. Well, I do. You've done enough for your country. And now the people say you're the only man who can rule the nation. Martha, in a true democracy, no one man should rule and no one man should be considered indispensable. Then why did they insist upon electing you? They made you president. They even wanted to make you king. The people chose me of their own will not to rule them, but to carry out their wishes. But if anything should happen to me, and I'm not saying that I knew, mind you, well, I'm sure this nation would get along all right without me. I almost wish you'd refuse to let them elect you. There were other men they could have picked. Mr. John Adams, for instance. <laughs> yes, Mr. Adams thought that, too. Ah, there's medicine now. Let him in. Uh, just let me get out of this chair. Oh, 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 Martha, Martha. General. Your arm, Martha. General, uh, oh. you... Oh, and Mr. Madison, someone quickly help. <laughs> Faster, Jason, give them the whip. If I go any faster, Dr. Bard, I'll break an axle on these rough roads. Oh, I know. I don't know why it is, Mr. Madison, but they always seem to be tearing up New York streets. Uh, go on about the president. Well, as I was saying, Dr. Bard, he'd collapsed just as I got there. Yes, that's right. The revived him, got him up to his room. He had a raging fever. And, and I... you said there was something wrong with his left eye? Yes, a great tumor of some kind, just above his left knee. Oh, 
I see. Well, I'm afraid President Washington may be in for quite a siege of illness, Mr. Madison. But I tell you, Dr. Bard, we can't let that happen. Not now, at any cost. Uh, unfortunately, illness never consults the convenience of the patient. But the very future of the country may be at stake. Can't you realize that? I'm a doctor, Mr. Madison, not a politician. What is it you wish me to do? Doctor, there is only one chance for this new nation to survive. Only one man strong enough to keep us together under one flag. Without him to guide us day by day, we are lost. But I repeat, sir, what is it you wish me to do? Use all the medical science you know. Oh, oh, there. Oh. Number three, Cherry Street, Is Dr. it Bard? within your power, see to it, that the president pulls through? Yes, yes. Uh, let's go to the president's bedside, shall we, sir? Oh, yes, yes. I'm afraid I harangued the doctor in my anxiety. I'm afraid I let myself get carried uh, away. That bag, Jason, if you please. My policy. Yes, sir. Here you are. Thank you. This way, sir. As a citizen, Mr. Madison, I share your anxiety over the nation's welfare. I'm sure you do, Doctor. But as a doctor, well, ooh, there's little I can say till I've seen the patient. The pill I gave you, I can ease the pain, Your Excellency. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Bond, the pain's much better. But, if you please, I prefer not to be addressed as Your Excellency. I have, sir. But, as you probably know, the public hasn't quite known how to address you. Yeah, I know. At the inauguration, <laughs> Congress wanted to address me as Your Highness. Oh. <laughs> and just what is the correct mode of address? Oh, just plain, Mr. President. I'm a citizen equal with any man, the master of none. But, uh, uh, what's your verdict, Doctor? Shall I speak plainly, Mr. President? By all means, this uh, a tumor on my left thigh, is it... Uh, is it cancer? No. I think it's a malignant form of shabon. Shabon? Mm hmm. I've heard the word, but I'm afraid I don't know what it means. Well, that's an acute form of carbuncle. As you can see, there's considerable modification in foul flesh. Yeah, but carbuncles aren't serious, are they, Doctor? Well, you said I could speak plainly, Mr. President. Well, of course, Doctor. Go on. Putting a course on your general condition, a carbuncle is, uh, well, it's quite serious for a man of your age. I take it you're somewhere past 60? Well, I only looked that old from years of hard campaigning. I'm, uh, I'm 57. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. No, President. No apology necessary, Doctor. During the long years of war, my hair has turned gray. I've become slightly deaf and uh, I'm almost blind. Yes, I see your spectacles there on the table. Now, before I give you my diagnosis, I'd like to know about your general condition. During the past few years, have you enjoyed good health generally? Oh, yes. Yes, on the whole, I've been very fortunate. Of course, sir... Uh, during the two months since I left Mount Vernon to discharge the office of president, I've, uh, I've had no exercise to speak of. Mm -hmm. How about your teeth? Any trouble? <laughs> Very few teeth of my own left, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Greenwood, uh, uh, down on William Street near the Battery, he's just made me a new set of seahorse teeth. <laughs> Ingenious, but most uncomfortable. Well, nothing very serious so far. Oh, how about clothes? Uh, there, I'm afraid you've found my weak spot, Doctor. It seems I no sooner get rid of one cold than another comes along and takes its place. It's most annoying. I'm afraid it's worse than that, Mr. President. But colds are nothing. In your present condition, a cold might be very serious. It might mean a dangerous complication. I see. Well, uh, at least we know what to worry about. Oh, please excuse me. I don't know why I'm so drowsy. Well, that's the pill I gave you to ease the pain. It's a strong sedative. Shortly, you'll fall, you'll fall asleep. And then before I doze off, Doctor, perhaps... Uh, You'd better tell me what I'm in for. I'm afraid it won't make pleasure listening. Well, I can face it. First, uh, there's something I should mention. As I came here in my coach, Mr. Madison very gravely worried about what would happen to the nation if you were unable to carry out your duties as president. <laughs> ah, Madison flatters me. Well, he's very worried. He's waiting outside now in the corridor, and he'll be even more worried when he hears what I have to say. Ah, Madison has nothing to fear. If I'm said to him, I put a great deal of trust in the ability of the people to work out their own destiny, so long as they're free. As a citizen, sir, I feel much better for hearing that, but as a doctor, I must tell you, you're a very sick man. Uh, yeah, I suspected as much. Uh, go on, doctor, tell me the worst. Very well. You must have an operation right away. Oh. Uh, what will the uh, operation be like? Hmm. In a situation as grave as this, Mr. President, I make it a practice to be frank with my patients. The operation will be extremely painful. And at your age, extremely dangerous. I'm sorry. There's uh, no alternative? None. All right, Doctor. I place myself in your hands and in the care of a good providence. I'm not afraid to die. My time has come. Matters not whether it come now or 20 years hence. 
Well, Doctor, I'm very sleepy. If you're through with me, I'm sure Mr. Madison is waiting outside to hear the news. I'll be back soon, Mr. President. Try to get some rest. Mr. Madison, what's the, what's the meaning of this? Mr. President, Doctor, how is he? All right, just a moment. Mr. Madison, where are all these gentlemen outside the President's door? They're all close friends and advisors. Where is Mistress Washington? Colonel Hamilton for Vail on to wait in her sitting room. Yes, Dr. Bard, in a case like this, we felt that the nation comes first. In a case like this, gentlemen, the patient comes first. Now, I shall ask all of you to quietly go down the stairs and out of this house. But, Dr. Bard... I will go at once and tell Mistress Washington... Of the president's condition. Please believe me, doctor. We're doing as we think best for the new nation. We must know if the president is all right. That is right. All right, all right, gentlemen. The president is gravely ill. Gravely ill. To correct a deep infection which may result in blood poison, he must have a serious operation. As I feared, Hamilton. Only uh, those of us here know of the president's illness, Dr. Bard. We think perhaps it might be better if the public is not told. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'm afraid that's out of the question. The president must have absolute quiet. Of course, Dr. Bard, but there... I shall ask the mayor to put up chains and close Cherry Street to all traffic. Don't but, you... Dr. Bard, I appeal to you as a citizen. Surely, Doctor, you can see that it might be wise for the president's illness to be kept secret until he's once more on his feet. As a citizen, gentlemen, I agree with you completely. I knew you'd see it, Doctor. Now, if ever, this nation can... Cannot lose him. Without his hand to guide us, this nation cannot survive. But as a doctor, I must tell you that General Washington will not be on his feet for some time to come. For that for weeks and perhaps even months. He will not be able to perform any of his duties as President of the United States. None of them. Uh, I assure you, gentlemen, I'll do everything in my power to save his life. <laughs> Listening to The President and the Doctor, starring Basil Rathbun as George Washington and Thomas Mitchell as Dr. Bard on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Two weeks have passed since Dr. Samuel Bard performed the major operation on George Washington. It is now July 1st, 1789. And although the critical stage has passed, the president is still in danger. But this morning, as Dr. Bard enters the big room on the second floor of number three Cherry Street, New York City, then the nation's capital, he knows that President Washington is worried about something which goes far beyond his weakened condition. Mr. President, I must ask you what's troubling you this morning. Forgive me if I'm impertinent, but I am your doctor. Uh. <laughs> I'm afraid you're on to me, Doctor. I can't hide a thing from you. Well, I'll tell you are a lot better than you are now, Mr. President. I'd prefer that you didn't hide anything from me. So come on now, up with it, if you please. What's worrying you? Well, Doctor, I'm worried about the people of this country. They have a right to know about their president. Only now there's no way to tell them, so rumor is taking the place of fact. Yes, I'd hope you wouldn't hear those rumors, Mr. Mm-hmm. President. Very little I miss, Doctor. You see, I got Sam Francis from the tavern to serve here as my steward. Yes, I know. Uh, Sam tells me the people are saying I'm suffering from all kinds of diseases, where some people even say I'm dead. Yes, yes, I heard that rumor in the coffee house yesterday. You may be sure I put a stop to it. The only thing that will stop rumor, Doctor, is fact. I will have my secretary, Tobias Lear, write to all the newspapers. Oh, well, that is, of course, um, if you agree. By all means. But you had a major operation. And we mustn't try to hide the fact that there's still danger. You're very weak. And I wouldn't answer for what might happen if we... If, uh, well, if we run into complications. Complications, Doctor? Well, I don't exactly expect any, of course, but... Well, I, I'm still worried about those colds. Oh, oh, I haven't had a cold weeks now. But you know, Doctor... Yes? The, the letters to the newspapers will do some good, of course, but the best thing would be if the people could see me. Uh, I, I know, I know, I know. I, I can't sit up or walk. And I, I know you think it's a bad idea, but I, I figured out a way so that I can get out and have the people see me. Please, Mr. President, you're a very sick man. Yeah, but this, this would help me recover. I know it would. Now, now listen, please, Doctor. We'll whip the seats on the insides out of the carriage. Rig up a litter for me to lie on and a seat for Mrs. Washington. And, well, there, Doctor, there you are. I mean, I, I could take a ride through the streets and the people could see me. 
Well, Doctor? Well, I don't know. The... Doctor, Doctor, it, it would do me a world of good. Out in the sunshine, the fresh air. Well, well please, it, Doctor. It might be all right, providing you take the necessary precautions. Yeah, capital, a great, But great. Uh, I must insist, sir, that you promise me one thing. Well, of course, of course. Come in, come in. Ah, uh, Martha, Martha, come in. Dr. Barley is going to let me and you, of course, go for a carriage ride every day. Carriage ride? Oh, but you can't even sit Oh, I, uh, I figured all that out, my dear Martha. I figured it all out. All we do is rip out the seats and the inside of the carriage, rig up a litter for me and a oh, seat. You know. There's one thing you must promise me, Mr. President. I, anything, Doctor, anything, believe me. Why, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm going to be well, well in no time. Yes, and when I see the people, get a chance to talk to them, the people will help me do my job as president. But I must insist. Don't drive in bad weather. I'm still worried about those colds. Just as I told Sam Bart, Martha... These daily carriage rides have been the best medicine I've had. Yes, General. You're looking much better. Better? Not that I'm almost well. It wouldn't surprise me if Sam Barnes tells me tomorrow I can take up my duties as president again. Oh, dear. What was that? Oh, just some thunder off in the distance. Yes, it, it looks like a storm coming up. General, I think you'd better tell John to turn back. That cloud looks like bad weather. Oh, it's only a big thunderhead, Martha. And besides, it's a good half hour away. Plenty of time. Listen. General, I tell you, it's a storm, and it's coming up very fast. Uh, well, perhaps you'll write it there. I'll, I'll tell Dunn to General. turn around. Hey, General! General Washington! Why, that... Yes, it is, Martha. It's Corporal Zebulon Pace. Who? Dunn! Dunn, stop the carriage. Well, General, I... Oh, I knew I'd get to see uh, you if I came all the way up here to New York. <laughs> Corporal Pace, how are you? Well, Zeb, this is a pleasure. Mistress Washington, this is Mr. Zebulon Pace. Formerly corporal on my headquarters staff. How do you do, Mr. Pace? Yeah. Mighty pleased to meet you, ma'am. The old general and me fit the revolution together. <laughs> yes, sir, I was with him at Yorktown when I lost this leg. Uh, excuse me, uh, General. Hey, it's all right, Martha. It's all right. Plenty of time. Well, Zeb, well, well. Uh, how are things with you? Couldn't be better, General. Fine. It was as good even for one legged man. Tell me, um, tell me, Zeb. Uh, what do the uh, people think about the way the government is going? You, uh,. Really want me to tell you what the folks are saying, General? Well, of course, Ed. Well, they don't like the capital being away off up here in New York. Now, you take the folks from Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, Carolinas, Georgia. They say the capital might as well still be over there in London. It's so far away. Oh, uh-huh. so that's what they're saying, is it? That's right, General. Yes, sir. And that may be the reason the states won't give up their rights to the federal government. Uh-huh. You know, some of the states feel like they're being left out of things. Zeb, I think you've helped me. Yes, I think you've helped me a lot. General Washington, the rain. Done quickly. Drive us home. I think that's the answer I've been looking for. Thank you, Zeb. That's all. Oh, dear. You're getting all wet, General. I was afraid of this. Ah, it's all right, Mother. It's all right. I, I wouldn't have missed that talk with Zeb for anything, only... There. Look. Look how wet you are already. Only what? Only, Mother. Uh, when Dr. Bard comes to call in the morning, uh, let's don't tell him I was out in the rain. Oh, good morning, Dr. Bard. Hmm? Oh, oh, a gentleman. Good morning. Will you join me? Well, if you don't mind. In fact, Colonel Hamilton and I were waiting for you to come along. Yes, Doctor. We wanted to talk to you before you called on the President. Well, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Frankly, Dr. Bard, we'd like to be able to go before Congress this morning and tell the members that the President has now fully recovered. It's very important that he give his full time to the nation's affairs, Doctor. I agree, gentlemen, but I believe you felt the same way when he first became ill. That was more than two months ago. Things are different now. We've got to decide once and for all whether the central authority is to rest in the states or in the federal government. Yes, Doctor. Things are now quite gone far that the federal government can't even coin money in, uh, up these steps. Now is the time for the President's voice to be heard. Well, Doctor, what is your answer? One that will please you. But uh, let's go in the house, gentlemen. Here, here. Along the hallway. I think Mr. Washington's health is now such that he can resume all his duties as President of the United States. Dr. Uh, Bard! Dr. Bard! Uh, Mrs. Washington! Oh, thank heaven the messenger found you quickly! But I saw no messenger, ma'am. 
But has you... Something's happened. Quickly, up to his room. The pulse is dangerously fast. Now, well, let's listen to your chest, Chuck. Oh. I'm afraid I've been a bad patient, Dr. Bard. I've got that cold you warned me about. We hoped, Mr. President, that we could tell the Congress this morning that you had recovered. Uh, I'm afraid not. Tell me quiet, sir, if you please. Is he... Can you tell us anything, Dr. Bard? A moment, please. Uh, now, sir. Let's have a look at those eyes. Rather painful for me to open them, Doctor, but uh, to insist... Uh-huh. Violently inflamed. Both of them. What is it, Dr. Bard, if you can tell us? Gentlemen, there's not the good news I'd hoped for. Complications, eh, Dr. Bard? Yes, Mr. President. Bad complications. Good heavens. What is it, Doctor? I'm afraid the President has a severe attack of pneumonia. <laughs> But go on, Quincy. Go on about the president. Well, that's the fact, as I get it. Now, I wouldn't want to repeat it, but the president's a lot worse off than we've been told. In fact, gentlemen, I have reason to believe that he may be dead. No, but Quincy, why do you say that? Well, it stands to reason. Now, look. Yes, yes. Everybody knows he was a sick man when he was inaugurated in April. Yes, but we used to see him in the street. Only for six weeks after the inauguration. Then he had that operation, and he got a little better. But he used to drive through the streets after the operation. He was on a litter in his carriage, and Mistress Washington was... But how long has it been since you've seen him in his carriage? I tell you, it's been weeks. Here it is, September already. No, gentlemen. When we learn the real truth... Wait, wait. Here comes Sam Francis, the president's steward. He certainly would know. Oh, Sam. Sam, come over here. Well, what have you gentlemen got your head together about? Is this a plot? Now, Sam, we want the real truth about the president. Quincy here says it's very bad. Says the president may be dead. That's right. Well, well, so that rumor's around again, huh? Well, gentlemen, when I left the house a few minutes ago, the president was in the best of health, laughing and talking with Dr. Barr. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, gentlemen. If President Washington is dead, he certainly seems to be enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Bard, at last you've decided to wash your hands today. <laughs> In spite of all you could do, I'm at last a well man again. And now that you're all right, Mr. President, I don't mind confessing that on two occasions I was more than a little worried. Yes, I know, I know. You've been a good friend and a fine physician. Thank you. I, uh, I realize I had a couple of very close calls. Uh, just, uh, just how long have I been sick? In more or less serious degree, for 109 days in all. 109 days? Yes, sir. <laughs> and in spite of what some people feared, the nation did not collapse. <laughs> no, Doctor. It became stronger with the strength of freedom. Yes, Mr. President. As you've said to me so many times, I sat at your bedside. In a true democracy, you said, advancement and progress must come from the people themselves and not from any one man. No matter how all-powerful he may set himself up to be. You know, Doctor, during my illness, you've become a real good friend to me. I shall miss our talks together very much. Especially if the, uh, the capital moves away from New York. Yes, I know there's been talk, but is the capital moving? Oh, there's uh, nothing definite on it yet. But, uh, well, it seems some of the states might be willing to strengthen our federal government if they... Capital were in a more, you know, more central location. Mm -hmm. Of course, Mr. President, if you think it's best for the nation. No, 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 the idea didn't originate with me. It came from the people. The people as um, represented in the person of a one-legged veteran named Zebulon Pace. Pace? Yeah. Zebulon Pace. Well, I, I didn't know you had an advisor by that name. <laughs> Doctor, uh, Zeb gave me his advice one day. Um, one day when I... Uh, I took a carriage ride in the rain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> carriage ride that almost cost your life. Yes, that's right. But if the capital leaves New York, Mr. President, where will it go? Well, there have been several suggestions, Doctor. Philadelphia, Baltimore, Annapolis, uh, Wilmington. As I say, it hasn't been decided. We, uh, you know, we might even build a, a new city for the national capital. What that would mean, that the nation's capital would be in a 
Uh, another wilderness. A uh, wilderness, perhaps, Doctor, but uh, a wilderness in a land where freedom shall remain a living ideal as long as its people are willing to fight for it. God prevent they should ever feel otherwise. For as I've said many times, Doctor, when a people shall have become incapable of governing themselves and fit for a master, it's of little consequence from what quarter he comes. And against such a fate, we must all try, all our hearts and all our souls. Thank you, Thomas Mitchell and Basil Rathbun. Now, here's Bill Hamilton of the DuPont Company. Doing the family washing is a job as old as the hills. Primitive people clean clothes simply by rubbing or pounding them in water. The Gauls in ancient France made a sort of soap by mixing tallow and wood ashes. There weren't many improvements until around 1800 when chemists made studies that greatly increased knowledge about soap and soap making. Since then, chemists have continued to study soap and to improve it. Today, soap comes in cakes and flakes in powdered form. And there are other detergents called soapless soaps. As women have been pleased to learn for themselves, these new cleaners are better in many ways. But the job is by no means finished. Chemical research has never ended. For example, chemists in DuPont laboratories, in their never-ending search for better things for better living, are at work on the problem of making even better detergents. They soil pieces of cloth with black, greasy graphite, for instance. Then they measure the exact time it takes to wash them clean with different cleansers. They make exact comparisons of how white the laundered pieces of cloth are by examining them under the photoelectric eye of what is known as a reflectometer. It was work of this kind which led to the knowledge that a compound we at DuPont now manufacture, DuPont Sodium CMC, helps to keep dirt from redepositing on fabrics being laundered. That is, a small amount of DuPont Sodium CMC added to detergents keeps dirt that has been washed out from sneaking back into the cloth. Brighter, cleaner clothes are the result. Well, you can't go into a grocery store and find a box labeled DuPont Sodium CMC on the shelf because the DuPont company sells DuPont Sodium CMC to manufacturers who use it as one of the ingredients in making their household detergent. It is a hidden value in the products you buy. One of those hidden values, invisible, usually unknown, that are so often supplied by the DuPont Company's Better Things for Better Living Through Chemistry. Next week, Cavalcade brings you Joan Caulfield and Ralph Bellamy in a true Cinderella story. The story of a beautiful young college girl who was wooed and won by a president of the United States. Be sure to hear Joan Caulfield and Ralph Bellamy in the charming story called Roses in the Rain next week on the Cavalcade of America. Tonight's original DuPont Cavalcade, The President and the Doctor, was written by Welburn Kelly. Music was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Bryan. And this is Ted Pearson inviting you to listen next week to Roses in the Rain, starring Joan Caulfield and Ralph Bellamy. Cavalcade of America is presented each week from the stage of the Long Acre Theater on Broadway in New York and is brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.